What's going on people, this is Akala and today we're going to be talking about the power of education by which I mean education in its broadest sense, school and non-school. So let's go through it. Formal school, this is my first book that I wrote, I wrote this in year 5 in primary school. Shout out to Ann Taylor, who was my favourite teacher in primary school, she got me to write this book. Man, so corny I even put fake awards on the back of the book. It's my first novel, it's called Search for a Perfect Life. But it wasn't all smiles and roses in school, as you'll know if you read Natives. What did I learn from formal primary school? I learned from formal school the basics, literacy, numeracy, but I also learned very early that life is not fair and the children are treated very differently based on what background they come from, the teacher's perception of their intelligence, of their social class, of their ethnic group, that school is a reflection of the wider society. So in a way, school gave me lessons that it didn't even realize it was giving me. I also had another school, an informal school, a Pan-African Saturday school. This is me on the newsletter of my Pan-African Saturday school, the Winnie Mandela school. And this supplemented my formal education and gave me a whole different set of values and a whole different set of inputs than formal education gave me. What I learned from my Saturday school is there are multiple ways to view the world. Blackness is not synonymous with negativity. Do not believe everything you're told. I learned pre-colonial African history. I learned the importance of independent learning. And I learned, as my friend the scholar MK Asante says, take two sets of notes. What he means by that is you take the sets of notes you need to pass a test in regular school and you take the notes you need for yourself to learn and navigate life. And that's what I got from Pan-African Saturday School. My education continued in this beautiful building. This place is the Hackney Empire. My stepdad was the stage manager of this place, meaning that when I was growing up, I got to see more theatre than most rich kids. Theatre with an F, by the way, that is correct. I got to see more theatre than most rich kids would ever see for free, four or five days a week. It was one of the great privileges I had growing up um, in particularly cultural, working class, African Caribbean led theatre in the middle of Hackney, even though I'm not from Hackney. You know, going there and being in that environment in which there's the only way to describe it, a working class black led theatre, watching comedians from the States, watching great plays like Black Heroes in the Hall of Fame or Sarafina, um, seeing great musicians perform there, a culturally very rich environment. What did I learn from the Hackney Empire? My lessons from the Hackney Empire, the main lessons that I think I've took with me, storytelling, stagecraft, the power of culture. And as you can see, those have all been very valuable to me to this very day. My education continued in this place, Yep, football. That's me, that guy, yep. No. Nope. That one there with the screw face. Yep, the angry looking one. This is me and my West Ham under 15s team in 1999. And again, football, it may not seem like something you learn intellectually from, but I took many, many lessons from playing football at this level. One of the many things I learned from playing football at this level was self reliance. I wasn't lucky enough to come from a family. My mum didn't have a car. You know, I didn't come from the kind of family that could drive me to football training all the time. I had to get on a train to Romford three times a week and rely on, on myself. But I also learned that discipline counts for much more than talent. Yeah, for any young people out there with an aim and an ambition, and you see people more talented, more creative than you. What I saw in football was the players that made it, with obvious exceptions, some people were just ridiculously gifted. But the players that actually made it as Premier League footballers were often the ones that were most disciplined, not necessarily the most talented. Though often those two things go together. You know, the more disciplined you are, the more you train, the harder you work, the better you get. You surpass people anyway. To give you an example, I remember coming in as a young person. So I was the year below Jermaine Defoe at West Ham. And this always stuck with me once I saw him in the Premier League, right? At this point, Jermaine was already Jermaine Defoe. He wasn't, he was just breaking into the first team, but everyone knew he was going to be a big player. Yet I'd come in in the evening, seven in the evening, and the only player from the year above me coming in to train again in the evening on his own was Jermaine and I remember that stuck with me like my man like he's from the ends as well and all that and he's got that level of discipline at 17 that level of dedication that level of self-commitment that even though he's the best player in his team pretty much even though he's already got a professional contract or gone pro as we used to call it he would come in in the evening and put in that extra work and he wasn't always doing fun stuff like shooting either he was doing quick feet he was doing all the neaky stuff that you need to be a six striker shout out to Jermaine Defoe you probably don't even remember that I learned that lesson from him but I proper remember thinking, oh, my man's serious. And obviously he's gone on to have the career that he's had. I had a coach at football and he used to say stuff to me at the time. I thought, what's this clown talking about? And he was dropping gems. So I'd be messing around with my friends, not paying attention, not running hard enough. And he said, oi, you should talk like this, you should mad cockney. He said, Kingsley, that's my real name. Your friends ain't gonna pay your mortgage. Yeah, 
Don't mess around with your mates. They're not going to pay your mortgage when you leave football. Imagine how real that was. Little did I know when all the men that made it at football, no one weren't going to pay my mortgage. Fam. Man had to pay my own mortgage. Sometimes, youngers, people are dropping gems on you, don't even realise. But one of the other, the, probably the last great lesson that I took from football was coping with criticism and disappointment. Yeah? Most people who play football, even at the level I played football, don't make it as Premier League footballers. Don't make it into football. And very early, 12, 13, 14 years old, your coaches criticise you in a way that in any other place would be considered challenges. Your coach shouting at you at football is just, you just take it because it's football. That's how the thing is, isn't it? If it was school, you'd probably complain to the governors or something. And so in a way, football or competitive sports toughen you in a way that other activities as a young person don't. So that was a continued and important part of my education. My first business was a restaurant uh, called Auntie's Cuisine in Ayanapa. I was 18 years old. I managed, wrote the business plan for, if you could call it a business plan in hindsight now, um, and ran a restaurant called Auntie's Cuisine. My aunties came over and cooked, my grand came over and cooked, and me and the man them ran a restaurant in Napa. Sounded like a great idea at the time, and it was a great idea, probably a couple of years too late. Um, Business-wise, it was tough, and you know, me and my friends got in a little bit of trouble, and so on and so forth. So all of those challenges came with being young man them trying to run a professional business. Um, but yeah, I learned lots of lessons from that. And since then, you know, founded the record label, Real Estate Records at 21. Uh, moved that into Immovable more recently, um, which is a, which does books, film and TV. And from running a business, especially if you're trying to run a business that is in line with your ethics. If you're running a business and you're willing to just do anything for money, then maybe business is not a place to learn moral life lessons. But if you're running a business and you're actually trying to apply your ethics to the best that you can, Within running a business, there are lots of lessons to be learned. It isn't always as glamorous as it seems. So from running a business, I learned, again, learning to cope with disappointment. Things will not always go as you expect them to go. How will you bounce back? But equally learning to cope with success when things do go well and you get to a stage where you can sell three, four, five thousand tickets, where you get to a stage where you've written a best-selling book, where you get to a stage where you've got a show on television or whatever it may be, when you achieve certain goals of yours, coping with success is as important as coping with disappointment and lots of people don't realize that um, from business i learned long-term strategy very early in my career as a musician i knew i did not want to make the kind of music that necessarily would get daytime radio and therefore we had to find a different strategy for long term and the strategy we chose to take was the strategy of being like a rock band really in the sense of getting out on the road and gigging, earning your supporters, fan by fan, supporter by support over 10, 15 years to the point where you build a solid, live, independent audience as we've managed to do over years and years and years of touring. And one of the other lessons I learned from running a business, particularly a creative business, is that hype and success are not the same thing. Hype can be very important for building success, but hype can be taken away. And what remains afterwards is success. You think of artists who've had great longevity, Jill Scott and Erica Badu and D'Angelo, even if they've had big uh, gaps in between, they've gone away for a while, Lauren Hill, people whose music has really connected with people across generations, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, etc. There's a certain soul and a certain ethic in what they do, I believe at least, that allows their music to outlast and outlive the hype. And even though obviously I'm not anywhere near on the level of the people I've just mentioned, it's that creative ethic that I try to strive after and that hopefully to some degree have achieved. In 2008, we founded a music theatre production and education company called the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company. Here is a picture from our launch workshop with Gandalf, because if you've got a picture with Gandalf, why not put it in? And some of the things I learned from Hip Hop Shakespeare. Fortunately, through the work of the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company, I've been able to travel all over the world um, and do education projects in probably over 20 countries around the world. And I've learned much about the education systems in different countries all over the globe. Some of the things I've learned are, Education should be fun and challenging, yeah? I was a firm believer from the beginning in the power of the creative industries to communicate difficult subjects, to teach soft skills, to engage young people with literature and storytelling, and I believe even more strongly in that now, education should be fun and challenging. We still seem to have this like Victorian idea in England that if it's not boring, it's not real education. I have a firm belief in the power of music for education. That's one of the other things that I've learned. And from teaching all around the world, I've learned that in a way, here in the UK, and to an extent in the States, more than other countries I've been to, it's almost like education is taken for granted. You go to countries where education is not so freely accessible, or where it's more valued, and people really see it for the gift that it is. 
I was very lucky growing up that I never grew up with that mentality or I was never conditioned to believe that being smart was trying to be like a posh person which unfortunately a lot of working class kids grow up with that or and I was lucky that my mum, my dad, my godfather, even my gangster uncles was all like no no you're gonna be smart and if you drop out of school we'll bust your head and so I only I mean, now that I look back I realise how lucky I was in that respect but from the work with the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company I've become even more convinced of the power of a creative education for the future especially with the way that the world's evolving with the power of the creative industries and so on and so forth a creative methodology and a creative approach towards education I believe is more important and more needed now more than ever and so one of the things we see is the transformational power of education you think of someone like Malcolm X goes to prison in the streets selling drugs whatever else becomes one of the most important political figures of the 20th century because of the stuff that he reads in prison because of the power of education you think of Toussaint Louverture who is enslaved up until age 30 becomes a free man becomes the first leader of what eventually becomes the only successful slave revolution in history again partly because of what he read and the stories that he read and the things that he studied and you think also about the danger and power of the maverick you think of people like Giordano Bruno or Copernicus or others who suffered because of their belief or their intelligence going beyond the bounds of accepted intelligence of the time or someone like William Tyndale who was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. And so education in all its forms to me at least as you will know is very very important and so here is to a lifelong love of learning like a Shaolin monk or a character from a Chinese Kung Fu film because that's just what I think of when I think of people learning until the day they die. Safe.